Boom! What's going on everyone? I'm Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skill, and this is Toy Talk. Today's discussion is going to be about metal casting. There are many types and different ways to cast metal. Sand casting is one of the oldest methods available. An example of this is where they take a pour molten iron into a sand mold. Sand molds have been used for casting everything from arcade toys to engine parts and other components for your automobiles. Engine blocks mainly. I saw this firsthand when I visited the foundry of the John Deere plant in Waterloo, Iowa. We toured this plant. It was amazing seeing all the, the equipment and all the stuff. It's hard to see, even dream of walking in a foundry these days, seeing the metal and the sparks everywhere. But anyway, what they did was they would take a pattern, they'd bury it in olivine green sand, pack it around it tight, then they'd crack the mold apart, they'd send it off to where they'd pour molten iron into the sprue, and then once it cooled, they'd pop it open and out would come an exhaust manifold for one of their diesel engines. Don't know what diesel engine they were making at the time, but that's what they were doing and that's how they did it. Very simple, very quick and easy process to make. But for today's discussion, we're going to talk about die casting. Because die casting, as you know, is probably the most common use in models. There is also some spin casting, but not too common. It, spin casting is for very low production level stuff. Die casting is the main way they cast models. Now, we're going to talk about what die casting is. How it is used in making model cars and trucks. Why it is so expensive and why it is becoming obsolete in making model cars and trucks. But before we start, this is a very complicated subject and I'm going to have to break it up into several videos, so stay tuned for those next ones. And if you take a moment to like, subscribe, and ring that bell below, I'd really appreciate it. That way you can get notified of all of my future videos and keep up with this series. Now, this video will briefly cover die casting a model from the raw metal to the finished product. The next videos will talk about production of the models and mold making. So stay tuned, you'll want to see those. Also for those of you out there, I've got a great reference available for you. It's a free report down below on die cast versus resin and model making. You can grab it down at the links in the description below. Now the big question is this. Do you want a unique toy collection that is the envy of all your friends and fellow collectors worldwide? If so, you have come to the right place to learn about all things die cast and resin. Follow along as I talk about the latest and greatest releases from the top manufacturers in the industry that will make your collection stand out from all the rest. My name is Logan. 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk. What is die casting? Die casting by definition. Now, this is the definition from Wikipedia, but die casting is the metal casting process that is characterized by forcing molten metal under high pressure into a steel mold cavity. The mold cavity is created using two or more steel dies closed together under pressure. Die casting is really just an injection mold process. That's what Wikipedia says, and it seems to be about accurate from what I've seen in the factories about making die cast models. This picture over here is a simple two part die cast mold. Depending on the complexity of the model, there could be many more parts to it, but most models are made using a simple two piece die cast mold. It does well. Now, for the die cast process. The mold is placed into the die casting machine. A hydraulic ram then closes the mold, compressing it together so that you don't have a seam. The molten metal is then forced into the mold cavities under high pressure. The die is then cooled, which solidifies the part, making a nice solid metal part. The die opens and the part is ejected. Usually there's a hydraulic ram that pushes the part out so as to not damage the mold. The cycle will then repeat itself over and over again until the desired number of parts have been produced. Usually they make a few extra just in case. That's it in a nutshell. Simple, right? <laughs> no, it's a little more complicated than that to make a model car. 
every part of the die cast model car or truck has to have a mold created. Now, that means that if you have a hundred parts that go into this model, you have to carve a hundred mold cavities. <laughs> oftentimes that means you'll have to make more than one mold to hold all those cavities due to the limitations on the size of the actual injection mold machines that the dies go into. Now there's just one simple exception to this. There's one part on all models that doesn't actually have to have a mold made and that's the wire axles for the wheels. But, and this is a big one, those axles still have to be cut to the exact length. Now this can be done by hand or it can be automated. Most commonly you'll find it's an automated process. Now, these two pictures here and here show metal being dropped into an electric furnace. Now this electric furnace is used to melt the metal and make a molten liquid. Now this molten liquid is forced under pressure into the die cast mold cavity in the die casting machine. Next the mold is then cooled which solidifies the metal making the hard part. The mold is then opened, the part is shoved out and dropped. The process continues to repeat itself until the right number of parts are made. Now it's pretty simple to do. The next step in this process is removing the sprue or the excess metal off of the model parts that we want to keep. Now this metal is not wasted. It's recycled. They take and throw it back into the electric furnace and makes the next part. Also, any uh, poorly formed parts, they'll also be thrown back in. So that model you're playing with right now, it might actually have been another piece at some other time. But this process is so recyclative, you'd never know it. Now, the clipping of the metal off the sprue, it's usually done by hand. Then the part is, gets smoothed. It has all the rough edges and the sharp edges uh, smoothed out so that the part becomes very safe for people to handle. Now, I saw this when we toured the Ertl factory back in the early 90s. It was pretty cool. They had this great big giant machine. It was filled with ball bearings that are being shot around. And they threw all the parts up into the top of the hopper all those sharp edges and everything else. As the ball bearings were blasted onto the part, it smoothed out all of those rough edges. It took out all the sharp lines and made a nice smooth part that fell out the bottom below. It was pretty cool to watch. Now that the parts have been smoothed and have all of those rough edges and sharp edges taken care of, they're ready to be painted. Oh wait, no, not quite. They have to be chemically treated in order to make sure that the metal is protected and so that the paint will adhere properly to the metal. Then they can go be painted. There are many methods and different ways to paint models. One method is the dip method. This is where they take the model, they put it on a carrier, and they dip it straight into a tank of paint. Now this isn't done too often in model making, but in real car making, it is done all the time. In fact, it's the way they put the primer on all the cars. Back in 1998, I toured the Toyota Motor Assembly Plant here in Georgetown, Kentucky. We used to be home to Toyota North America's headquarters here. Now all we still have is the plant where they make the Camrys and the Avalons and the Sienna van. We also make some Lexus here. But anyway, when I was touring this plant, we saw the body after it had come out of the robotic welders. It was hanging on a chain above in the ceiling and it came along and there's this great big vat in the floor. The chain came and it brought the car and it pushed it down into the vat, then pulled her right back up. It dripped for a bit, the car was painted and it moved right on down to the assembly line. A very quick process to apply the primer paint. Now, the finish coat wasn't put on this way, but that's how they put the primer on to get it done quick and in a hurry and it made sure it covered all spots. Now another method of painting is the powder coated process. Now powder coating is where they electrostatically apply a powder paint onto the model and then it is heated in order to melt the paint onto the model. <laughs> this is a cool process to watch if you can ever get a chance to see it. What they do is they have a big gun that's spraying out this powder up and down all over the model and powder's falling everywhere. But it's not wasted. They go in, they sweep the powder up and they throw it back in the hopper to paint the next batch. We saw this when we toured the scale models. Uh, toy factory there in Dyersville, Iowa when he was still making toys. At the time I think they were painting 
New Holland's because it was New Holland blue powder that was everywhere, but it wasn't going to be wasted. Very little got, very little didn't go back into the hopper. But anyway, another use of powder painting you've seen is on automobile wheels. This automobile wheels will take a tremendous amount of abuse from the elements and from just driving and every day. We used to have either steel wheels, chrome wheels, or just alloy wheels and, and then hubcaps. But now with this powder paint, because it's so durable, it adheres and makes such a strong bond that doesn't chip, we've been able to paint wheels and come up with a very, very good durable product. And that's thanks to powder coating. But anyway, enough of that because that's not what we're talking about today. Today we're going to talk about spray and airbrushing because that's the most common method that's used in painting your model cars and trucks that you have sitting on your shelves. Now airbrush spray painting is a very simple process. You take your cleaned, chemically treated parts that have come in ready to be painted, you hang them on a tree, you push them into the paint booth, and that's where you take your airbrush and you spray the parts. Simple, right? Now anyway, most of you actually do know about airbrush painting and have an airbrush. But for those of you that don't know about it, an airbrush is a small air operated tool that sprays various media, most commonly paint, but also ink and dyes along with foundations by a process of nebulization. Or simply put, it takes the media and turns it into a very, very fine spray and applies it to the model. Mass produced models are hung on a tree and then they are moved into the paint booth. Oftentimes this tree is hanging on a chain from the ceiling above, which carries it across into the paint booth. Now, while they're in the paint booth, that's where they receive their coat of paint. For your more mass produced models, this is primarily done automatically, but your smaller runs are hand applied. That makes a much better, cleaner finish at the end, even though it's a little more time consuming. After that, the finished painted models are taken on this carrier into an oven. That's where the paint is baked on. This is a crucial step in the painting process because this is what makes the paint adhere to the model and gives you that durable, long lasting finish that doesn't chip easily. And that's what we want in our models, right? Finally, our model is ready to have the detail applied. Now this detail is generally applied with a pad printer or a silk screen process. Sometimes they'll use decals. That was kind of an old method, which is pretty much gone by the wayside or they have often will use a hand brush that detail is very fine but sometimes it's necessary in order to get the right part and get it in place it takes a very steady hand and a very patient employee but it's done quite regularly but anyway for what we're talking about normally they're going to be off to a pad printer now the pad printing process is pretty cool the model is put into a carrier and this carrier holds the model in the exact spot where they want the machine to put the graphics. Now these three pictures, one, two, three, they are there to show you how the model is held in its restraints for the tampo pad printing. The center picture shows the model with the pr pad printer open. And then the third picture over here, it shows the model after the pad print has been done. Once the print is done, as it is in picture three, that model then goes over to an oven where it is baked for a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on the type of media they used or the amount of uh, paint they put on. Sometimes it takes more. Now, either the model is goes on to the final assembly line or it goes on to get another pad machine after it comes out of the oven. Now pad printing can only put down one color at a time, just one. Now that means that if your logo has three colors in it, it'll have to go through this process three times, once for each color. Now, then if you wanna put it on the other side of the model, it has to do this again, doubling the number of times. So you can see this is a quite intensive process, but it's well worth it because it gives the best finish possible for those graphics. Now our model is complete. Wait, did I say complete? Oops, <laughs> what about the chrome parts? What about the bumpers? What about the wheels? Wait, what about the rubber tires? Oh well, I'm out of time in this video. You're just going to have to wait and stay tuned for the next one where I'll answer the qu these questions and more. Also, don't forget to grab that free report on diecast versus resin. 
it'll really help you make the decision and let you know that resin is the future. And as always, please like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell to get notified of all of my videos. And if you've got a friend you think would enjoy this, please share it and send it on to them. Thanks for watching. I'm Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skill, and this is Toy Talk.